like we always do about this time. So 2005, that's about 15 years ago. Where were you as far as, as music? Were you were you still an artist? Were you making beats? Were you an engineer? I was I was making beats and, and starting to get into the engineering like right around that point right there. I, I checked out a rap for a little bit because it just got um, that the Master P era and stuff like that. I still fuck with it, but rap got so commercialized mm -hmm. and it was so just the same thing all the time. And then I heard uh, Kid Cudi's Man on the Moon 1. Mm -hmm. And I was working with this rock band in the studio and we were they were just listening to this Kid Cudi album. Mm -hmm. And I just heard like this this different thing. Like there was just something else in there. I was like, oh wait, this is different. Y'all y'all like y'all y'all fuck with this too. It's like it's different. Mm -hmm. It wasn't made to be like a, on MTV and it wasn't made just to be a club song or anything like that. And then from that I started getting back into rap music and really into like everything that's going on in Atlanta. Like Gucci like was just signing yeah. everybody and just finding new artists and just all these different sounds. Outcast was like on the tail end of their thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just like it was really inspiring. And then I started seeing that in Houston there were so many different kinds of artists. Mm -hmm. And if you think about where we're at right now, just from just from Mo City, just from like the A Leaf area over there, uh, Max O'Cream. Yeah. Toby Nwigwe, mm -hmm. Tisa Korean, mm -hmm. like all these guys, like they none of them sound the same. Yeah, and Houston was always pigeonholed as like that. that whole everybody slam. raps like this. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about this. That's all there is, and and it's like nah, these these kids just they grew up on the internet. They got every kind of influence that you could possibly have. Yeah, and I think that that's what set us up now because if you go back to Atlanta, like in the in the late '90s, early 2000s, Atlanta. Like the Jermaine Dupri era and the Goody Mob era and the Outkast era, you have all these different. None of those guys sound the same. Mm -hmm. You had the radio stuff coming out. You had the cool underground hard stuff like Gucci and stuff like that going on over there. Um, and this cool Outkast documentary, you can see. Uh, they uh, they practice. Was it Dungeon Family? Was that their? The Dungeon Family. Uh, uh, the uh, the one on Netflix. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I gotta see it. And like you can yeah. see, like they're practicing in this room with this dirt floor, mm. and you see this little kid on the couch, and that kid is Future. Oh, I gotta go back and see like that. Future, future, <laughs> that like it's a it's a young future, just just in there, just absorbing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the reason why their music scene was so good is because everyone was different and diverse, but they really fucked with each other too. Yeah. That being said, the one thing that we forget in Houston and and things that we're always down on ourselves for is we don't have that industry here. If you go to L.A., New York, or Toronto, LA. they're they're known yeah, as music yeah. cities, but they also shoot tons of movies out there they're entertainment cities there's publicists there's a and r's there's record labels there's all the things that that set up for a, a music music artist to blow up mm -hmm. in houston we just have good local artists yeah there's there's not a lot of labels like if you ask anybody about a houston label they're gonna say rap a lot which yeah back in the back in the day like that was a thing but what artist has rap a lot put out now recently yeah we talk about rap a lot now everybody's like oh well drake but they didn't sign Drake. They didn't put Drake out. Nah, they introduced Drake to Lil Wayne. So we got a place in there. Um, but they didn't put out Drake. Mm. Can you imagine if Drake would have been put out from Houston? Like he would have he would have sped it up. Yeah. Oh man. Okay, okay. So um now uh the transition from, from the beat making to the the engineering for you, was it because you know, was it out of necessity because you had nobody to go to? Was it because the guys you were going to, they were trash or? There was a there was a weird double standard in studios. If I went to a studio to work on a, a rock record with a band, mm -hmm. it was, because um, most studio owners are failed musicians. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and it, or not, I'm not gonna say failed musicians, but it, it just didn't happen for them the way that they wanted it to happen for them. They mm -hmm. don't want to tour, they want to do this, so they, they, they get good at recording themselves, so they start studio. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of what we all did, but when I go there with the band, because these guys are musicians, it was a different language. Mm -hmm. be like, oh, what guitar is that? Oh, I got this guitar. Let me show you this amp. You like this amp? We got this sound. Da, da. When I go to a studio with a, a, a rapper mm -hmm. or a set of rappers, it was that. It was still this this last little weird shit of that ain't music. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, especially here in Houston, even though that was the only thing since like I mean in the seventies we had like. Like singer songwriters, like uh, what's his name, Stephen Van Zandt and shit like that, blowing up out of here. Mm -hmm. But we, it was, rap wasn't still seen as a thing until like mid late two thousands here. Yeah, and you would just feel this whole different vibe because that's not music. Like, where's your band? Where's your where's your instrumentals at? Da, da, da. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there was when I first started, there was still this really weird 
thing, but I was like, nah, like this is the, this is gonna be the future of this city. Mm-hmm. And the people that I was meeting, uh, like Todd and Chris and everybody from Bears, like nah, like there's a way we can work with this. Like uh, when we first started here, we had this room set up for drums and live bands and shit like that. Mm-hmm. I haven't recorded a band in like a decade. Okay, that was gonna be my All next do, question. <laughs> nah, because when you work on an album with a band, it takes so long. Mm-hmm. It you you work on an album for six months, you work on an album for a year. The, you lose a drummer in that time. Mm-hmm. Somebody wants to change this. Someone wants to change that. When we started just going straight to vocal artists, like singers, rappers, stuff like that, I work. I do it over a thousand tracks a year. Mm. Wow. For like ten years straight, over a thousand tracks a year. Every and every engineer in this building has that kind of output. That's how much of it is here. Mm-hmm. And then technology just making it where you can get on YouTube and get a beat. Yeah. You you you'd be like, man, I fuck with Drake. Let me go get this Drake type beat yeah, and, yeah. and write a song for it. Like it just, that's why rap dominates because you can't do that with nothing else. Mm-hmm. And every time there's been an obstacle thrown in front of the rap artist, it is immediately like figured out and overcome. Yeah. Like, and rock music and other genres like that, they're retroactive genres. Like in, in rock, there's only so much you can do before it's not rock and roll anymore. Mm-hmm. So if you and so when you listen like all these new rock bands that come out, they all try to sound like this other band from the '60s or this other band from the '50s or this other band from the '70s. Mm-hmm. And if they're too futuristic, then it's not rock and roll. And right now, like the big thing is all these bands come out and sound like shit that I grew up on in the '90s. Yeah. But with rap music, because it's the seed music, because it's the it's the seed culture, rap music is the only thing that can take from anything. And kind of put it through its own filter, and it's still rap music. Yeah. And that that for for me as a as a as a pr- musician first, then a producer, now an engineer, that's what I've always loved about it because there's unlimited potential. Mm-hmm. If you would have told uh, if you would have told those guys back in the day of that don't push me like those real staccato raps from back in the day, like yeah, what these kids would be doing net, like Playboy Cardi. Mm-hmm. If you could go back to 1977 and show them motherfuckers Playboy Cardi, <laughs> like they'd be like, <laughs> yeah, they am fucking this close. <laughs> but uh, not it wouldn't be in a bad way mm-hmm. like you just can't you can't think of where it's going to go or where it's going to come from mm-hmm. and i can play a a rock man or i could go back in the 70s right now and play somebody something rockish going on from right now and they'll be like yeah that's the c chord that's the e chord they use that in this creedence clearwater revival song and then this nirvana song and that like mm-hmm. rock music was so just predictable if i heard the first two seconds of it i could tell you what was going to go on throughout the whole song yeah now with this rap music Bro, I don't, I don't even know, but like, but Kanye, perfect example. Mm, my favorite. If you heard one Kanye album, you heard one Kanye album. Mm. Everything he's, everything he's gonna do is just gonna be different. Yeah. And what other art? Drake, Drake, Drake does the same thing, but on a real commercial level. Mm-hmm. Kanye don't need radio and all that other stuff. Drake, he'll, he'll get on a song with like Black Boy JB, or he'll get on a song with like two, like McConan on that Tuesday song. Yeah. Or Migos and or do some patois kind of sounding like. Uh, Jamaican, shit. Jamaican shit yeah. and it's just like yeah like it works like wh- he, whatever he wants to do he can do it mm-hmm. and to me like that's the from an engineering point of view that's the coolest thing in the world because there's no there's nothing wrong that you can do mm-hmm. um, the coolest thing uh, of Houston rap though too like Travis Scott and like Don Tolliver and stuff is like we got this like psychedelic like reverbs druggy. and delays yeah. and this little druggy sound and I, uh, I saw this interview with Future and Future said that in his generation of artists they went from being the um the drug pushers to the drug takers. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was such a cool, such a cool comment. Yeah. Um, and it's also like a, just a good, to me, not that drugs are good or bad or anything like that. I, I don't have a dog in that fight, but if, if we're able to kind of internalize social things like that and put them out into music, like that's real healthy to me. Yeah. Because why does every, why does every aspiring rapper only have to rap about being from the streets mm-hmm. or hitting a lick? Or going to jail, or da 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 da. You yeah. know what I mean? And it, it we got all these different things. And rap has always had those different things. Mm-hmm. But when you look back at it historically, it's always kind of pigeonholed into like one sound. Mm-hmm. You know, we had like a in, in the beginnings, you had LL Cool J on that like I Need Love kind of like he was like the first Drake. Yeah, yeah. You know, he would do Mama said Knock You Out, and he'd do I Need Love, I need and you love. would still feel like either way like you were good. He mm-hmm. was acting, doing all that shit too. Um, you had the disco stuff like Africa Bambata and all those other things. Um, and then you had like the hard street shit, mm. you know, like, uh, like the, what is a, what's um, the guy that did the message and stuff like that? Oh, uh, Grandmaster Flash, I think. Yeah. And like think. Sugar Hill Gang and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. So like, there's always been all these little, all these little flavors. Mm-hmm. Um, just in Houston for a long time though, we just kind of were in this, 
this bubble. Yeah. And I used to think that was a bad thing. And now when I look back on it now, in hindsight, I'm like, nah, that was perfect because it, it did the same thing that Atlanta did. Like, we just had this bubble. We weren't influenced by so much stuff outside. And now we just got all these artists like setting trends. Like, Travis Scott has got kids in hmm. Japan wearing Astroworld t-shirts. Yeah. Like, that's crazy to Going me. Going crazy over his water, his, his, his McDonald's t-shirts. Like, burgers and shit. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, man, that's crazy. This kid from Mo City. Culture. Yeah. Um, and he he did his first records here. Mm. Um, Chris Masick, the owner of this studio, is the one who showed him, like, that was his first time on auto-tune. Yeah. Wow. You know, and he just, you just see, like, the possibilities, like, blowing up. Like, oh, shit, we can do that. Okay, yeah. So we're in a historical <laughs> institution right now, guys. Yeah, okay. But, um, so, uh, being a, being a fan of, 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 of rock music and, and, and different genres, where do you, do you do you see something that that you wish that rock me I mean that that rap musicians were doing more that you see rock musicians like 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 you say the thing about how how they look down on rappers because they said it wasn't music or anything but I feel like I feel like rappers could benefit from you know listening to different types of music Absolutely. and venturing out especially now with with it being so so cool because like also like you said you know you had LL Cool J doing his thing but you had these guys doing their thing. Now you know you got the 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 um the pioneers like you got the the Max o Creams the Tisa Koreans the Don Tolivers the Travis Scotts but then you also have the guys who who feel like the only way to get on is by replicating that. Yeah, I think I think rappers need to just have like this um, self confidence and self love for what they do because mm -hmm. there's a weird there's a weird double standard, um, and it's something it's something that's kind of ingrained in the rap community. I was reading this thing with Andre 3000 and they're basically talking to him about why he's not making music. Yeah. And he's like, what is, I think he's like fixing to be like 50 or some shit or in his late 40s. And yeah, he's like, no, nah. he's like, rap's a young man's game. I don't know, you know, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, cool. That might be for you. But I guarantee Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones and Keith Richards and shit, these motherfuckers are like 80 years old, still, still selling out tours. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't, they're not just stuck there. But this is also the first time in history where. I'm 43. That, that some of my age can be sitting on his porch and on his rocking chair listening to like Dr. Dre's 2000, yeah. <laughs> like the Chronic. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and so like it's still it feels like it's been around our whole lives because it has, but it's still really young compared to all these other forms of music. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. what rap artists don't realize and what they don't give them the the accolades for is if if I if I see a rock artist and I'm like, man, what are you doing? Like, I play guitar in this band, and there's just this. That's what I do. Yeah. When I see a rap, a young rap artist, not someone who's made it yet or anything like that or make a living off of it yet, but a newer rap artist. When I see a new rap artist, I'm like, man, what do you do? Oh, I rap, but I'm not just a rapper. Like, it's always followed up real quick. Yeah. Like, there's this this negative thing or this, you have to justify mm -hmm. that you're not a rapper. You're not just a rapper. I also do this. I'll, I'll, I'm also into fashion. or I'm also, and I'm always like, what's wrong with, what's wrong with being a rapper? Like, yeah. why, why, don't, why do you not feel that that's, uh, that's art? Because it is, yeah. and it sets every single. You can't find a fucking. Oh, sorry, I don't know if we. Can no, you good, you, man. You good, you good, you good. <laughs> you can't find a, a country song right now that don't use auto tune, that don't have eight oh eights and shit in there. Yep, yep. Like it in in the in the in the history of the United States, music has always been taken away from black culture, reappropriated, and then spit out through like this white filter. Mm -hmm. And when you grow up, and that's the the way you think that it is, it, it, it takes a lot of heart, and it takes a lot of soul from what you do. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know it. You don't even know it. But at the same time, if we just left it to these kids, it'd be fine, because when I see something like XXX Temptation, or um, Juice World, mm -hmm. or any of these new kids that come up, right? Even when you look at them, what do they, they look like rock stars. Yeah. They got their hairs dyed. They're wearing a shirt, a Slipknot shirt, or a Marilyn Manson, a little Uzi would be rocking his little Marilyn Manson chain and Marilyn Manson shirt. Yeah. They were influenced by all that shit, and these kids, without even thinking about it, they're not waking up every day and being like, you know what? I'm gonna reappropriate black culture and black music and in and, and fashion mm -hmm. and in music and art, and I'm gonna re reappropriate that for us, and I'm gonna bring it back out to my community. Yeah. I doubt they, I don't think they're thinking that, mm -hmm. but that's exactly what they're doing. All on their own, all natural, like they're influenced by that, they do it through their filter, and then it comes out right. You go to these rap shows now, 
man, these kids are just like moshing, stage diving yeah. and moshing. It looks like some shit that I'd went to as a kid, like in the '90s, mm-hmm. skateboard ramps and shows and shit like that too. Like it's just like, and they're not they're not even trying. Like it's not a political message. It's not anything. It's just that energy. They can do it, mm-hmm. and yeah, the energy, the energy behind what they're doing. And I just wish that new artists and new rappers in particular would know like how important their place already is, and that it's not a denigrating thing just to say you're a rapper. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, um, you've worked with with plenty of artists. What is, what are some of the some of the differences you see from the more established, serious artists versus the newer guys that come in here and might not have it all the way together? What What are the, some of the differences you see? the the new The new artists have no confidence, mm. and the professional artists, they got all the confidence in the world. Mm. And and it, there's a difference between being confident and arrogant for sure, mm-hmm. but you got to have some of that. New artists do too much. They, they do. They just do too much. They'll come in and they overthink it. They're not sure on what they're going to say. Mm-hmm. They'll, do, they'll, they'll put a song together and they'll, they got to have three tracks of ad-libs going on for some reason. <laughs> they got to have all these stacks and all this extra shit going on. Yeah. And, and I'm like, man, listen to Drake. What, what is Drake doing? Drake songs are so, they're well-written, mm-hmm. well-produced, well-engineered, well-mixed, well, all the, all, the, all the things are there. Mm-hmm. But what is Drake doing? Drake ain't doing shit. Like, he's just in there saying some shit that sounds good, mm-hmm. saying it with a good voice, on a good mix, on a good beat, and it's it's that simple. Yeah. It's that simple. It's not, there's not a lot of overthinking and, and, or anything else like that. When I work with professional artists, these guys pop into the booth, they do what they're going to do in the booth, and then they're like, cool, man, I'll see you later. Send me a mix whenever you're done, or I need it by this time. And, like, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. A new artist, they'll be in, and they'll be trying to, Micromanage the mix oh, and yeah. standing over your shoulder and being like, "Oh, I don't like the way that sounds." And you're like, "Whoa, man! Like, I'm in. I've been in the studio for like ten years. Like, <laughs> I know what it's going. My, I don't care what it sounds like here. Mm. I'm mixing for what it's supposed to sound like in the car and on the radio and all these other places. Yeah. Like, they just. Um, but again, you can't fault them on that because there's no, there's no information out there for them. Mm. But when you're a professional artist, you have a team around you that you really trust. You got a photographer that you trust. You got a video person that you trust. You have a mixing engineer that you trust. You work with producers that you trust. Mm-hmm. And your job is to lay your vocals down on, and give a good performance. And that's all they think about. Yeah. Um, a, a newer artist that's just popping and just gonna go on to great things like Doe Man, uh, Doe Man Dino. Dino, yeah. Man, this kid just insane flows verbiage like he could hold his own with Kendrick mm. J.I.D. Cole it, like any, just he can go toe to toe with anybody out there right now yeah that dude all he all he cares about he don't give me no mixed critiques no nothing all he cares about is did he do his part right did mm. he come and perform his track right and so and I think uh, new artists don't understand that their job is to give you a good performance yeah and then their job is to trust the mixing engineer to give them a good mix mm. because they don't know about mixing. Yeah. And and with rap music too, another cool thing I love about it, if you take a Playboy Cardi mix, like off of that off of that whole lot of red album, mm. and you compare that to like Kanye's Jesus is King album, that's like two, two com- different worlds. Yeah, but it's yeah. still rap music. Like mm-hmm. it's still like it's still the same genre. We would still classify it as the same thing, but they're just so different. Yeah. Um, and I I love that. I like that we can have lo fi stuff and we can have this punk music sound and rap mm-hmm. we have the soundcloud sound and rap and then we can have like the super radio pop rap mm-hmm. and it can all it can all exist mm-hmm. um but new artists do a, they just do too much right and they need to quit doing too much get way simpler and just keep putting out content because like that's the big difference now is i used to wait for four or five years on an artist to put out an album mm-hmm. and you'd you'd stare at that that vinyl or that cd cover like the whole the whole time you would know every producer on there every songwriter on there you'd be looking at them pictures you'd be listening to songs all of the for credits the, the fucking thank yeah. yous the <laughs> and now it's just like nah like there's so much out there and there's so much competition out there the only way to stand out I think is just to be dripping I mean, even from your like from your perspective as a as a content creator on YouTube mm-hmm. if you only made one video a year what kind of fan base would you be able to get now zero like you, you just couldn't mm-hmm. And and I think artists need they don't understand that because the the first the first hard lesson for a new artist to learn is that they're not special, mm-hmm. and that's a hard that's a hard thing for people to learn. Ooh, talk about that a little bit more. But, that's, that's because powerful. like artists get this thing of like, I'm gonna go get this tight beat on YouTube, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna say some shit that's relevant to me, 
And say I listen to like Young Boy all the time, right? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna get a Young Boy type beat, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna do some Young Boy type shit, and and I'm real with it. Like I'm feeling it. Like with the words I'm saying, like this shit happened to me. Like my mom did say that shit to me. Yeah. I did get kicked out of my house. Yeah. I did sell grams. You know what I mean? Or all this shit, right? Mm-hmm. And then you put it out there, and like people literally think someone's gonna be knocking on their door the next day and being like, "Oh, no one ever <laughs> said it like that before." <laughs> Like let me let me sign you. Here's a million, please. Here's a million dollars. How do we get you into the studio? And that just that yeah. just ain't what happens. Like it don't it doesn't happen like how, that. How often do you see that? I see it like I think I think every artist, I think every artist goes through that phase. Mm-hmm. I think it's just part of the, I think it's just part of the thing. Yeah. Um, that your video on 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 Mac Miller, oh, uh, on how Mac Mac Miller jumped your game, <laughs> a little bit. Like I thought yeah. that was such a good. A good perspective because mm-hmm. that's that's another thing that that you go through too is like there's no um you know thankfully there's there's channels like yours and stuff that kind of help people approach things and think think of things a little bit mm-hmm. but the first thing the artist does is like they're just based on their feeling of what they're doing and that's it yeah and when they learn that okay like there's a bunch of people out there with that same feeling mm-hmm. then as soon as you get over that though the benefit of getting over that is like cool now what do I do different yeah because uh, artists are real scared to be different, mm-hmm. and in rap, it was it was always discouraged to be different, and now it's not like that. Now we want different yeah. stuff. We want different things. Kendrick Lamar does not feel like he ha- that he can make the same album twice. Right. Kanye. Kanye, be damned if he ever makes one of the first three albums ever again. Yeah. No. Nah, he's he's on to yeah. something else. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Wow. That's like like so many gems like just packed in. Okay. Now. Um. Uh, we're gonna kind of get into the uh the mixing part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Uh. You ain't gotta give up none of your secrets. Man, man, I got I got no secrets. Like, there's okay. no I got no. Just like that, there ain't nothing I do this special. Like every other engineer be doing the same shit. It's the same. It's it's the same thing with just every artist, bro. Like every kind of art. If I ask you to paint a, a sailboat and you ask me to paint a sailboat, we're gonna both gonna make a sailboat and they're just gonna be different. Mm-hmm. And and we gotta embrace like that. We embrace that. And with mixing, I think we embrace that stuff. Again, my most one of the most streamed things that I've ever worked on would probably be Mop, Anti mm, Supreme, wow. and I think last time I looked, it's in like 15, 16 million streams just on Spotify, not even the other ones. Humble flex, humble flex. No, but like <laughs> I didn't record it. Like Tisa did that shit at his house. Mm-hmm. But you mix it though. He kind of. He sent me like a a version of the beat and a version of the vocals, and and, and that was just him being nice. Like that's just him wanting my my stamp mm-hmm. on his stuff, and and just based on our relationship, and. That started with, he came in one time, I think we had a session, maybe a one or two hour session, and he came in with a bunch of 30 second beats off of FL Studio, like the little 30 second little snippets, mm-hmm. and they were all using just the stock sounds in FL. Wow. Just the, no no extra VSTs or none of that shit, just the, the shit that FL comes with, the stuff that every other producer bitches about having, mm-hmm. or says that don't sound like music, that sounds cheap, that sounds this, that sounds that. He came in with a bunch of those. We loaded them up in one Pro Tools session. He went in there and just kind of freestyled over everything. Just the, the craziest shit in the world. I remember him just whispering Alaska and doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. He's, and we yeah. had we had five minutes left in the session. I was like, well, you might as well just jump in there and do one more song because we got five whole minutes. Like, yeah. And, man, that man went in there and did dip. Wow. Three months later, he had a deal. Like, like wow. On just some – and I – I didn't know like that he was gonna do like what he did then because at that point too I, we were just starting to see Houston artists start to get noticed again and, and start kind of popping through. Mm-hmm. But what I realized like w- one thing that Tisa really really taught me is uh, our first conversation was he was like I don't like being in studios and I don't like engineers. Mm-hmm. And I was like all right what are we what are we gonna do like <laughs> yeah and he was like because everybody tells me you have to do I have to have reverb on my vocals I have to do this I have to do that and I was like bro it's your song I don't care what you do like. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I grew up more like watching artists like Rick Rubin and some of those yeah, guys where, fuck. nah, that motherfucker just laying on the couch like, you know, yeah, that sounds great. Like, yeah. or not, you know? And and to get out of the to get out of the artist's way. Mm-hmm. Because when you realize that you're working with someone who's not one of these insecure artists that just needs help and trying to find their way and you see someone with their own vision, mm-hmm. then, then you got to get out of the way and just let their vision happen. Right. And I told Tisa, you don't want to reverb on your vocals? Cool. You don't want to use compression? Cool. Like, I don't care. All I'm concerned with at that point is, can they hear your beat? Can they hear your vocals? Right. And I just trusted him to do what he did. And, and man, I didn't think that he was going to do it like 
bad. Mm-hmm. Like he just on the weirdest shit. Like again, like <laughs> factory default. <laughs> stock sounds. stock sounds and shit like that but the stuff like you just can't deny that like when you hear it even if you don't like it even if you if it's not your thing mm-hmm. even if you all you listen to is fucking J. Cole and Kendrick or something like that when you yeah. hear that shit you're just like there's just something about it that you never heard before yeah yeah and it, and it draws you into that and I was uh, listening to this um, podcast with Kenny Beats and Rick Rubin a couple months ago mm-hmm. and Kenny Beats is sitting there with Rick Rubin in Europe and he plays Antisa Korean's music on the podcast. Mm. And so I'm getting to hear this dude that I've always looked up to who kind of started rap with Russell Simmons. The first yeah. record label, first song, rap song ever on the radio and shit like that. Mm. They were behind all that kind of stuff. And he's just listening to Antisa Korean's music. And Tisa Korean made that in his house in Mo City. And Rick Rubin's like, yeah, man, it's like what we used to do. It's just like minimal and it's just the 808 and the words. Yeah, And I was like, that dude just got it. Like he just, he just got it. It wasn't all this other posturing, all this other shit. He was just like, oh, I see. Like I see what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And they have someone like a, a Kenny Beats who has this huge platform, one of the most well-known producers in the game yeah. and stuff like that. Really good at creating content for YouTube and Twitch yeah, and all yeah. this other stuff too. Like he's just kind of multi out there, and he's just like this, um, this music anthropologist. You know, and he's just going around and showing different OGs like these young he's real interested in these little scenes that develop and he's yeah. talking about all the shit that's happening in Detroit and all this stuff that's going on everywhere else and he's just giving you this rundown of rap underground rap history that's going on right now yeah. and Rick Rubin's like oh yeah I get that like that feels good yeah and like that's it that's all that matters and that's why I guess that's the that's the thing is like new artists just need to see that's all that matters yeah. how does it make you feel right because right. there are exactly. trash mixes out there that make people feel really good and they blow up and get millions and millions and millions of streams mm. and then there's stuff that's overproduced and over thought about and overworked on that just gives you no feeling at all and that shit doesn't do anything yeah okay okay so would you say a, a good mix could could make a trash record sound a little better or better or a, a mix can't say the trash Man, it's hard. A mix can save a track. It, it really can. Mm. And there's been there's been a lot of um. Yeah, yeah, Foster. like you can, you can. Polishing turrets but, here but, at but then, Studios. But then, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't think the mix is ever supposed to save the track. Right. It can. It can help. Uh, there's a famous story about uh, Billy Jean um, between Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson. That Quincy Jones was not fucking with Billy Jean. Mm. Quincy Jones didn't want that to be the lead single off the Thriller album he was like the album's called Thriller you just made this thing called a music video that was a new idea at that time that's like a movie you know and why would we drop this Billie Jean track like Mm -hmm. Quincy wasn't fucking with it and he wasn't fucking with the mix he wasn't fucking with the the production of it he wasn't fucking with the band he wasn't fucking with none of it and that they were arguing about it not being on the album or being on the album uh, to the point like where they're like in each other's face over this song and that the, the story is that this intern came in and, and was just setting up the tape machine and Billy Jean happened to be on the tape machine and the intern played it in the background with the arguing and then they're both like sitting there arguing and Mike just starts like doing his little thing yeah. and Quincy's like, whoa, 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 what mix is this? What mix is it? Because they got to like to mix 90 or some shit like that, something crazy, mm-hmm. just mixing it over and over and over again. And so the mix that ends up being on the album is like mix two because that's what was on the tape machine when they heard it that, they just heard it wow. in that frame of mind. Okay. So like yeah, a mix can save a song, but I don't think a mixer mixer's job should ever to be to save the song. Mm-hmm. When you're learning mixing, that should be your job. Like you should be thinking of like, how do I, how do I make this do this? How do I make this do this? But I think the longer you do it, the more you're like, nah, get in there and redo that shit. Like, right. Your your job is to cap. I feel like my job now is to capture a really good performance mm-hmm. and to make the artist like so comfortable that they want to give me a good performance. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's gonna be in the booth. Sometimes that might be in their bedroom. That I think, and that's kind of where mixing and stuff is gonna be going like in the future, I think. I think more beat producers are mm-hmm. gonna be like the first engineer. Like their job is kind of make that beat and get the vocals. Yeah. And then for me personally, like I wanna start getting more outside of the studio. Mm. I wanna I like I wanna roll up to someone's house or I want us to get a B and B for a month. That's and make a record and do those kind of things. Cause when I see like a childish Gambino uh, that this is America album like you know they just got like a fucking mansion and he flew like Alex Tumay and these top engineers out there mm-hmm. 
you know, or what Travis and Kanye do, like in Hawaii. Yeah, or uh, yeah. what the what the Red Hot Chili Peppers did. Uh, yes, they worked oh with, man, uh, Rick Rubin, yeah, Funky that's, Monks. Oh, yes, bro. Yeah. yeah, that's such a good, man. Uh, what? That's a great documentary for any artist. Give I don't care what, what chill, I don't man. care what kind of music you do. Like everybody should go watch that documentary too. Yeah, when when it's when, called Funky Monks or something like that. Yeah, when, it's when he, black and white. When he talks about how how he rode under the bridge and it's just like, and then then they 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 bring the the ladies in to sing and then on uh I think uh I can't remember what song that is uh Breaking the Girl where they're playing on the pots. Yeah, with the big old logs and shit like that. Fuck, yeah, man. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And 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 to me like that's what every. I think I think every every artist should do the easiest thing first. Mm -hmm. Get a beat off of YouTube, get the cheapest studio or engineer you can find, or cheapest microphone or interface you can find, mm -hmm. and start making music. Like that should be the first thing you do: start making music. Right. But that shouldn't be where you end up. Mm -hmm. Like that should be where you start, but you should end up at the house or the big studio, working with other artists of your peers right. and other producers and, and you know you should you should start off on YouTube beats and you should end up on that like Revenge of the Dreamers kind of shit like to me like that's like the Man. good the good path right there yeah that's the that's the dream right there and it's hard for artists to navigate that I, I have to I, I where I'm at right now is I turn a lot of artists away and it's not because I don't fuck with them as people or it's not because I don't fuck with their music to me if you're not on track out beats and you don't own like exclusive rights on your beats and stuff like that, mm -hmm. then you shouldn't be paying someone a hundred dollars an hour to record you. Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah. just, it doesn't make economic sense and you can do that. And it's cool to do it as a hobby, but at some point, like there's only so many hours in the day and you've got to stop messing with people that are just doing stuff for a hobby. Mm -hmm. You gotta like, you gotta get in it with people who are doing it for a living because once you see a kid like Tisa or Don or Dome Man, once you see these guys blow up and like it changes their lives, mm -hmm. like you want that for everybody. Yeah. But not everybody's gonna get, not everybody can get there like that, especially if you don't evolve as you go on. Mm -hmm. If you've been rapping for, for five years and you're doing the exact same thing you did when you was rapping for five weeks, that's probably why you haven't blown up yet. Right, right. I think that was my problem. Wow, wow. And, and, and again, it's no one's fault. It's just, you're trying to put yourself in one percent of the one percent, mm -hmm. like the, the odds, the odds of being a, a, a musician that makes or an artist that makes their money off of it is just any genre. It's it's really small, mm -hmm. but the odds of making money as a as a mixing engineer is really small or a producer. Like, where I mean, you probably got better odds of like being an NBA star, right, than being a rap star. Yeah, there's only so many so many spots, you know, and um, even for the. I read this crazy statistic the other day. It said that even for major labels like Atlantic, that we don't hear of 90% of the artists they actually sign. Mm -hmm. We only hear like of the 10%. Right. So they got... We probably got, I want to make sure we're... All right, we can keep going. Okay, okay, it's all right. So like uh, for, our, for every 10 artists that we hear of, there's, there's 90 yeah, that wait. we don't, that still, that still got the record deal. They mm -hmm. still got all those things that we think that's what we want, but we just we don't know who they are. Right. That's how competitive it is out there. And oh. you can, I mean, it's the same thing for YouTube though. Like, you're up against how many content creators out there? M millions in the tens of millions. I see it all the time, man. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And to me, like that's just like it's staggering. Like you're just like, how do I how do I step out from this? How do I do this? Yeah. Um, but also just you know, and the stuff that you give you give people really good advice though, like. You're a, uh, you have one video where you're talking about going to the store and getting some oranges and some pineapples and stuff like that. And you oh, say, yeah. And you say it the one way, and then you say it like that extra the way. super exaggerated yes, way. Yes, yeah, man. Yeah. And it's like, that's such good <laughs> advice because that's another thing that I just don't think that new artists like think about. Like, they just, they don't think about the extra. Mm -hmm. And I think for mixing, like, to me, like, that's the same thing. When when I first started recording rappers, like you didn't put reverb on the vocals, mm. we didn't use delays on the vocals. That was some weird shit. Like no one, no one did that, especially in Houston. Yeah, in Houston, every artist had to do a main a main take, two stacks, stacks, some emphasis, and like it was just this one sound, and that was like the sound. Yeah, and then artists like Travis and them started coming up and just like. No one was taking his music seriously here in Houston. You mm -hmm. weren't. You weren't gonna hear Travis Scott 
in he, here? No, not, not until he got with I think I heard his music in L.A. before I ever heard it down here. Yeah. But then as soon as L.A. said that shit was cool, now... It's gone. Now it's gone. Uh, man, Toby Nwigwe, like, totally different kind of artist, totally different kind of sound, very traditional, very, very lyrical. Mm-hmm. He's got more of, like, a, a Christian message behind, behind his stuff. Um, but, man, that guy, he found a way just to do... To do him and he put out a video he did a, a thing called get twisted sundays and he really like his his work ethic kind of shaped the way i tell people to work now I, mm. albums are important for every artist yeah. when kanye makes a record i want to hear a record from kanye mm. when travis makes a record i want to hear the the record mm. i want to go see them at a show and i want them to play that record and i want to see how they do that record live yeah a new artist i've never heard of before they should, I don't think they should make records. I don't think you should make records. I think you should drop every single thing you do as a single. Single. And just keep it, keep it dripping out. And as soon as you've got this fan base around you, then then you need to make a record. Mm. And I, I guess uh, for a new artist too, they're just going, kind of going back to that thing. That's a big thing too. It's like, if, if you and I were to go fishing right now, and I got a bag of worms, mm-hmm. I would never just take my whole bag of worms and just throw them all out there at once. Right. Especially like if, if I'm just getting started. If I'm hungry, if I need to eat, that is not the way that I would do that. Yeah, I would sit there and I'll take one worm at a time. I'm gonna put one. I'm gonna cast one over here. I didn't get no bites. Hmm. What What am I gonna do different on this one? Let me try this one over here. Two weeks later, a month later, whatever. Oh, okay. I got a little tension on that. Mm, great metaphor. <laughs> I'm gonna do one over here. You know what I mean? And you yeah. just start start building it up a little bit because the process is where where it happens. It's never. Again, it's this is hard for artists to hear. It's never on the song. Mm. It's the process of you making these songs that introduces you to other artists, that makes you go out to shows and meet other people, that makes you find producers and meet and network with other people. Like it's that, it's the whole act of just making the art that makes you successful at it. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not just the end result of the art itself. Right. And again, with bands, have an easier thing of doing this because they're all musicians, and you got to find other musicians, and those other musicians know other musicians and your guitar player knows someone who works at a record label and your drummer knows this person who books shows and tours and do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, the rap, yeah. The rapper is this solo, this real solo dolo mentality that everybody starts out with mm-hmm. but I've never met a successful artist that, that is stuck in that solo dolo mentality. Right. The rap like that shit, they'll say it because it's cool. Yeah. But Kevin Gates got a team. NBA Youngboy's got a team. Playboy Cardi got a team. Mm-hmm. Like they all got you... They all got hundreds of people who are trying to get them to shine too. Yeah. And if you can't get if you can't get ten people around you, how are you gonna get ten thousand? How are you gonna get ten million? Like you, you gotta it's you gotta embrace other people helping you out. Right, right. So if if you were to give an artist one person that they could have, would you tell them to find a producer? Would you tell them to find an engineer? Which one which one do you think would be more critical for them? Like like and, you know, it may be a different answer for different stages. Yeah, but the, my engineer friends will be real bad about this one, but <laughs> but definitely the producer. Okay, I, I think I think the just uh, kind of, Toby a good example of this too. Toby he did his get twisted Sundays thing. Every Sunday this man dropped a video, mm-hmm. and I want to say it was like a GoPro, straight on straight shot. He's sitting under a couch and he's getting his hair, uh, hair braided by his wife, mm-hmm. and he was do like the chill will be or you know this this beat of the day like whatever the industry beats were yeah and that's just showing people he can do it yeah smart and he did it every week so then he's showing people that he's consistent so even if you weren't on the religious messaging of it or anything else like that you just started seeing it once a week Mm -hmm. and before you couldn't see toby as just some guy you saw once a week you can only see toby as a rapper yeah you can only see him rapping but he did songs back then too where he did the full on videos and stuff like that mm-hmm. and the beats are just some like beat stars beats or some YouTube kind of beats and stuff mm-hmm. and when you see those like yeah they're good but you can't help sound dated like that yeah if you get a if you get a tight beat from 2012 you're always gonna sound like 2012 mm-hmm. he hooked up with this producer named Nell who does all his stuff now and she just had a sound like she had a sound mm-hmm. and when you put his voice and that sound together Okay, now this is not. We can't put a date on this. We can't put time on it. Mm-hmm. This is this is your sound. This is your thing. Yeah. Um, and just kind of like you know, like with Lil Wayne and Manny Fresh back in the day. Yeah. 
like Wayne worked with a bunch of different producers, but when I think of Lil Wayne, I think of like Lil Wayne and Manny Fresh. Like there's just something about the the chemistry between them two. Yeah. Or like you know DJ Premier or Guru and Jay Z. You know what I mean? Like there's just this uh, having another ally making music with you. Yeah. When you have a producer that produces around the way that you rap and you rap around the way they produce, mm. like that's just a you just can't get that from anywhere else. And again, I think every artist should start with a free beats and, and do all those things. But I definitely think like as soon as you get, you need to be making music with other people too. Okay. Because it's not a no one's going to discover you in your own bedroom. Right. Right. Okay. Um, kind of back to the the engineering thing. Are there ever times when when you're in here working with artists, whether whether new or old, where you you put your insight in, or or do you kind of kind of never cross that line? Or it it really depends on the artist, but but most artists I work with are real, they're real hands on too, mm-hmm. and so they're real like I, most people I work with are real open to whatever ideas that there are. Mm-hmm. Uh, I try to be conscious of the fact that I'm a 43 year old white guy, and and I want to. I want to make sure that I let the artists kind of do their thing. Mm-hmm. But there's lots of times where I'll be like, bro, like that word don't mean what you, <laughs> what you think it <laughs> What's that? There's a, there's that little Yachty song where he's talking about the strings on a tuba or yeah. some shit like that. Yeah. I don't remember Full exactly. strings like a tuba. Yeah, or some, shit. Some, some shit like that. <laughs> and I saw an interview with this kid and they checked him imagine. on it. Like they said something to him and Yachty was like, yeah, like the one told me. And I was just like, yeah, that, that engineer, somebody should have said something that day. I could imagine what you mean. <laughs> I could imagine, man. But man, it, it, when you make music in a room full of people and everybody's goal is to make it the best thing it can possibly be, mm-hmm. like then there's no pretense or you don't feel weird about bringing out an idea or something. When you're when you're a younger engineer and you're working with newer artists, though, mm-hmm. you can you got to be real careful not to throw curveballs because you can tell someone, "Oh, try it like this," or "Do this," and they can't. And when you hit that moment, like that, just kind of like takes the whole energy or whole vibe down. So, so I try to be conscious too of what I think the artist is is capable of doing. Mm-hmm. But my goal with somebody, I never get someone in the booth, especially the first time I work and be like, "We're making hits today." Like, nah, <laughs> like, nah. It's a journey. It, mm-hmm. it, it's a journey. It's not a race. It's a marathon. Like okay. that, that's kind of the way I look at it. All right, right. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a marathon, not a race. It's, you're dropping gems all over the place, man. Okay, so um. If you could only use one plugin to to like 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 if 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 it's like hey man you only got one to work with to mix would it be compressor EQ reverb which which one could you make the most out of man it probably has to be like a just like an SSL channel strip because it's got the compressor it's got everything on there, yeah. <laughs> and the EQ and right. stuff you and can't every cheat. can't cheat can't cheat that's a cheat everywhere you go like the, I don't know man I don't know I'm a I was going through a, a making radio edits and performance stuff for the. There's an artist, a Houston artist named Don't Ask Jen. And it's amazing. Mm. I mean, this guy is just doing his music just different. Like I don't, I, it doesn't sound like anything else to me. Yeah. And I'm going through trying to make these performance versions the other day, and I did something different on every single song. I mm. just, I'll get bored and I'll just try to wild out. Okay. And I, and I feel like I'm doing something really different than I did on the last thing. But then when I listen to the album later on, it all sounds the same. Yeah. So it just I don't know, man. I don't I don't think there's just one one plug in. Okay. Um I do recommend every engineer get like the torrents first. Get those all download right, all right. those free plugins. The wave and, nine. Yeah. <laughs> and figure that shit out and then when you like stuff though, then buy the and when you start making money on it then yeah, use right, it. Right, you know? right. But man I guess one thing that Yes, invest invest in your craft people. Isotope makes a plug in called Neutron three. Mm-hmm. And I've mixed whole records just with that plugin. But again, it has compressors and EQs and everything like that. Oh, the, the, the Nectar, I think. It, it's the... ma- it, it came right after Nectar. Okay, like, oh, it's, so it's, it's Neutron. Neutron, Neutron 3. Like, I've mixed, I've mixed whole records just with that plugin. Or okay. just with the SSL channel strips and stuff like that. Okay, damn, I gotta check that out. Okay, um, hold on, let me uh, pause for commercial break. Like, we need, we need, we need, like, what you're doing, like, this is all like healthy for the city. Like this mm-hmm. is, this is all part of it. Like it's again, it's not just gonna be the music that comes out of here. When we look back on twenty twenty one, Houston, Texas, like post COVID, Houston, yeah. like it's gonna be content creators. It's gonna be musicians. It's gonna be movies. It's gonna be all that shit. Like yeah. and that's what happened in the nineties. We rap a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's what, rap a lot. That's what the hell we need, man. All right, go ahead. Yeah, no, 
my shitty uh <laughs> my shitty FM mix on here. <laughs> what is that neutron right there? Or that's uh, nectar. Yeah, that's nectar. They look real similar too. Yeah, I'm 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 so I I got I got tired of of of, of like not being able to hear myself. <laughs> so I just I just said, is this the easiest way out? But um Um, so, uh, and, and probably, uh, uh, when will you be able to show me that other place? I think it'll probably right now. All right. All right. All right. L let me, uh, get a, get a few more, uh, questions in and then, and then, uh, that way I can kind of film some of that too. Uh, okay. So a couple, a couple uh, more mixing questions. Um, I got guys. That, that the number one the number one mixing engineer question they ask me is how to make their vocals sit right in the mix. I know you probably get that a lot too. What 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 advice would you have for that? If if you understand compression, I recommend everybody track with compression. Because mm -hmm. that's one thing I don't see a lot of people do at home, but almost every studio does. Mm -hmm. So even if you got an Apollo, you know, or a Scarlet or something like that. You find like a low latency compressor that way whenever you're getting louder mm -hmm. it's keeping the vocal even because mm. compressors their job is gonna they're gonna take like the the bottom the lowest sound that we hear mm -hmm. and they're gonna take that highest sound we hear and their job is to compress it they're gonna sandwich it and it's trying to make it stay mm -hmm. that way when the bass is in you hear the voice when the bass goes away you hear the voice mm -hmm. compression is a it's such a hard thing because it takes time to to hear it yeah you can hear when it's overdone and you can hear like when the vocal disappears. Mm -hmm. um, so when people always think about making their voice stand out, they're always thinking about EQ, because it's real easy for us to grab an uh, EQ band and raise it and, and hear more, because yeah. we just made it louder. But you could also just turn the vocal up louder, and it's probably gonna do the same thing. Compression, though, is really what makes a track, what makes a vocal sit in the mix and makes it stand out in the mix. Mm -hmm. Especially because now, like, there's so many hit, there's Grammy award-winning songs out there where we don't have the track outs of the beat. We don't have all the individual instruments in the beat or nothing. It's literally like a two track of the beat. Like you, the beat's mixed. Yeah. And you gotta put them vocals on there. And a lot of times producers are not making beats with the mind of like a vocal being on there or anything else like that either. Mm -hmm. So to me, like there's just the the eight oh eight's important, the, the sub's important, the snare's important, everything else to me is a vocal. Okay. Like it's it's eight oh eight, vocal and snare. Mm -hmm. If I can hear those three things, I don't really care about it. like I don't care about nothing else. Mm -hmm. And most fans don't either. Most fans are not like, man, you hear that that sample in the background does not nah, like the the fans always just want to hear the artist's voice. Like that's the most important thing. Right. Even the the new J Cole album that just dropped. Mm -hmm. That man's like he always has more of like a '90s kind of sound to me, like a throwback sound on his stuff. Like you listen to Forest Hills Drive and stuff like yeah. that. Like everything is like the vocals are in there a little bit. Mm -hmm. His new stuff because he's been doing songs with. Young Thug and on tour with them and stuff like that. This new stuff that he just came out with, like his vocals are just like in your face. big and loud. But we'll be able to listen to that five years from now and the song's still gonna sound good. As music goes on, vocals get louder. Yeah. We can go any genre. We can go back to country music, rock music, rap music. We can listen to vocal from 20 years ago. That shit sounds small and in the beat mm -hmm. and there's stuff over it. It's just, especially in rap though, it just, they get bigger, 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 and bigger. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, um, Tell me this. Uh, I, I've I've heard this thing about um, the the your your voice should be the same volume as the snare drum. Is there any truth to that or? Kind of, but sometimes you want the snare drum over the vocal. Mm. Sometimes you want it right under, and and sometimes it just it just depends on the song. Mm. Like it just depends on the song. Um, me personally though, I like the vocal. I always start a mix with the kick drum first. Mm and then the snare drum, and then the vocal. Mm -hmm. And I won't have a no, none of the piano stuff, none of the music stuff, the 808 shit, nothing, just that, that kick drum and that snare drum. That's like the anchor points right there. Right, right. I feel the kick, and I feel that snare, and that's where you get, you start getting that groove in there, and then I get the vocal there, and then I get everything else up around that. Mm -hmm. The artist always wants more sub. Right. Like we always, we just want more sub. Yeah. Um, but the more sub that you get, the less loud you can make the whole mix mm -hmm. because that that sub just eats up all the energy it takes up all the space yeah so if we go back to tracks like uh a millie a millie got a real good 808 
Mm. Uh, like I think Bangladesh produced that track. Yeah, it's just like simple, simple track. There's not a lot going on. It's Lil Wayne's voice and like 808s. Mm. That song can never get as loud as like something off of Astral World or something oh, like that. Yeah, no. Where there's mm-hmm. Mike Dean just Mike like Dean crushing that shit. Yeah. And that's like a good example to me of when you hear, if you're thinking about compression, mm. listen to like Amelie by Lil Wayne, where it's more natural. Like his voice is natural. Still a, a very well mixed song, like a really beautifully put together song. Mm. Um, but if you want to hear what compression sounds like, then listen to something like Sicko Mode. Oh, man. The, everything is compressed to the point where it's distorting and breaking up. But that's also like a an aggression thing. The more you compress something, the more aggression you get out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more you feel it. But it's just that, and I don't, I don't know, that maybe there's 10 years, 15 years between those two songs. Mm-hmm. But they sound like night and day different different approaches and mixes and Mike Dean like you know people don't realize like he's from here yeah Mike Dean's from Houston Mm -hmm. Mike Dean was working with Scarface and Selena and Selena Mm -hmm. yeah people don't people don't realize like this man is still like what Houston was off on don't matter Mm -hmm. this man been shaping the sound yeah working with Kanye early Kanye album yeah yeah Yeah. um okay um when uh do you use auto tune, mellow tune, whatever? Which one do you use? It, it's real weird. Um, Dorothy, the the engineer that you met when you first got here, her mm-hmm. and I were just talking today because we just got the new the new auto tune subscription, uh-huh. and she's like, she never uses auto tune. Mm-hmm. Artists she works with, they never use auto tune. She hand tunes everything. Mm-hmm. It takes a long time. Yeah. It's a skill. Like there's 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 um there's mixing engineers that are known for how they hand tune something. Yeah, and when you work with like a, a, a traditional R and B artist like Beyonce or her or one of those artists or something, you don't want to hear a, mm. lo- a lot of auto tune. Like mm. they want to hand tune everything. All the artists I work with, straight auto tune. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. on while you're rapping. I like to record with it on. That way, the rapper can hear how how their voice is going to change. Okay. And how they can affect it because then they start figuring out. They're like, oh, when I bend my note like this, this happens. Yes, yes, yeah. that's what I try to tell people. It's like it's it's almost like. Like, like from the outside looking in, you just think it's auto tune. You just think you're gonna go in and 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 use it, and it's gonna work. You have to actually know how to bend the notes yeah. and make it, you know, bend it to your will. Yeah, it just makes you perform a. It makes you perform a certain way. Mm-hmm. And and I love it. Like I don't. I, every year someone's like auto tune's fixing to go away or something like that. Yeah. I'm like, nah, man, it, it, it's gonna change. But but if Jay Z couldn't kill auto tune, like no one's gonna kill auto tune. Right, right, right. So. In, in all your years of doing this, you never just been in the studio by yourself and cut the auto tune on and tried to sing. Oh yeah, bro! I made a I made a whole little video. It went it went small time viral before of just uh, just singing through auto tune, just talking about how there ain't no presets in auto tune. Yeah. Because every oh that's another new artist. Yeah, give me that give me that da 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 sound on the auto tune. Give me that Travis Scott all the time, all the fucking time. <laughs> give me that Travis Scott sound. It's like whoa, that's not a. That's not a button. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, hey, that's that's his voice, with auto tune, a harmony generator, saturation, this kind of compression, this kind of EQ curve. It has to be on this kind of beat, this kind of key. Like, there's 20 things that go into that man's mm-hmm. vocals to make them that man's vocals, and you could do the exact same setup on someone else, yeah. and it ain't gonna sound nothing like it. Yeah. Um. So, th- I think that's another thing, and mixing engineers do a bad job. Of letting people know what we do, and that's starting to change now. Alex Tumay is a big yeah. proponent of engineers starting to get credits on albums, mm. you know, and people knowing like uh, in, he had a an artist dropped a song the other day, and he name dropped Tumay. He's like in the mix, like Alex Tumay or something like that. Yeah. And like Tumay, like reposted that stuff out because we do such a shitty job of telling people what we do. Mm. They literally seen us up there going, and they're like, "Oh, he just hit that button. That's my sound." Yeah, and it's like, nah, man. <laughs> I like took all your. I took one breath, in your whole song, and I replaced every single breath with that one breath because I thought that was the one breath that I liked. Mm. And then I made sure this other breath that you did was three decibels louder than this other breath because it felt like more man. energy to me. Yeah. And you had these shitty S's everywhere. You're like on everything. So I found this one tight S and I replaced it with all these other S's. Damn, that's gotta take time. Yeah, it takes a lot of time. And when we hear these albums that we love, like. Yeah, the artist might have been off the shits and on some coding and some shit and just came in there and did their shit and walked out, but a mix engineer spent a month of his life making that shit feel like as good as it can be. Yeah. And that, so that's not fixing it with the mix, but but edit, I mean, think of it from a video point of view. Mm-hmm. And this is why I don't do mixing anymore with the artists around. Mm-hmm. And it took me a long time to get that 
into my head. I love when I do a mix now. I don't want no, I don't want nobody around me, mm-hmm. and that's not to discount like anybody's taste or opinions or nothing like that. If I recorded the song, especially if I recorded it, I should know what the artist is trying to do with the song already. Right. But I want to be completely by myself when I do the mix now. Mm. Can you imagine making a video and having to go through the editing process of the video with the artist around you or with the subject of the video around you? It's, it's, hey, change this. It's boring. <laughs> or you, you do a freeze frame and like they're making a weird face or some shit. And then, you know, and then you lose, they lose all confidence in you yeah. or something like that. It's like the artists don't really understand the mixing process. And so I just I don't want him to be a part of it. I want to I want you to do what you do. I'm going to do what I do mm-hmm. and then I'm, you're going to listen to it and then we're going to move on from that spot. You're going to be like, "No, nah, do this, do that." You know, and, and I think that's for me, like that's the best way to work. Yeah. I don't I don't I don't want anybody to stand over my shoulder turn this up, turn this down. You'll do that later like whenever I send you the stuff, but I want you to listen to the song for the first time in your car. Mm-hmm. I want you to listen to the song for the first time on your phone. Right, right. Not, not in here. Everything sounds great in the studio. Mm-hmm. We got big subs in here. Like everything sounds fine. But I really like. I'm adamant now about art, and I lose. Like I lose clients over this. Mm. Like no, nah, like I'm not. I'm not that guy. Like there's other engineers. Like if you want to do a song an hour and stand over someone's shoulder and tell them how to do their job, like cool. But yeah. like I'm not. Like I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. I want someone that's coming in. Like man, what do I got to do to give you the best performance of this song? Right. Like help me. Help me figure out like what arrangements we need to do for the song and all these other things, and then now you do your job, and then let me give you feedback on what I'm hearing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the way I work now. Okay, and uh, and you mentioned that that uh, now now you you prefer to, to mix at home. What what is the what is the difference between for you you know creatively that gets you kind of going at home versus in the? That's the cool thing about COVID, man. I spent ten years in this room. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I and I love this room. Like I, I know how it sounds in here. I was really, when COVID hit, we were shut down for a couple months, mm-hmm. and every other studio was shut down for months. And I was so nervous. I was like, man, I'm gonna have to go get a, a regular job. Like mm-hmm. I'm just trying to like rethink life at this point. And I was like, nah, like I need to figure this shit out here. And so it was real cool. After doing it for so long, being kind of stuck back in a square one position, mm-hmm. and then having to refigure out my room and. Uh, People also don't realize like how much the room affects how we mix. Mm-hmm. You know, we think it's the speakers. Someone will be in a room and they'll go buy uh, two thousand dollars speakers and still make shitty mixes because yeah. the speakers are only thirty percent of it. Like we're not hearing the sound out of the speakers. We're hearing the sound the room, room, like yeah. fill up in the room. Yeah. And and it forced me to kind of. I'm I'm always admirable of these kids these, that make beats and FL at home on some headphones, mm-hmm. and it's the coolest shit I ever heard in my life. Mm-hmm. And I'm always a fan of the bedroom producer and the bedroom artist and the, and these guys that are making music on laptops and shit like fucking Billie Eilish like they made that record in their bedroom. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, a professional mixer came in and mixed it, yeah. and then a professional mastering engineer came and mastered it. But there's something uh, creatively being at your spot at your house yeah. that's just that's just different. Right. Um, the studio's cool. I love the studio, but me personally, I like I get up every morning at ten o'clock in the morning, and I listen to music for about two hours. Mm-hmm. I just I go down most necessary, a rap caviar. I go through blogs, pitchfork. Just I just have yeah, this routine pitchfork. that I just yeah. do all the time, and by noon I'm mixing, and I mix until like four in the afternoon. Then I drive here, and then I work a session from eight to midnight every day. Mm. And then I sometimes I go back home and mix again till six in the morning, wow. and I do that every wow. single. How do every, you? How every, do you? <laughs> every, everybody in my oh. family they can sleep like I don't know how they do it. Like I can't sleep on the speaker. <laughs> is is the room is is the room you're mixing in like yeah. far away from? The... No, like that's our like literally like our bedroom. And because I was I couldn't get a good sound in there, and whenever I set up my desk and stuff in my room, I got this big ass queen mattress like sitting right behind where my speakers are mm. and it's just sucking up all the all the frequencies and all the bass and it helps right yeah and so i just got really used to like i, I actually like the mixes better now mm. that i do at the crib but it takes me twice as long twice as long okay it takes me longer but i like that process more because for a long time when you first start engineering you should be focused on being as fast and efficient as possible because mm-hmm. that's how you get work and that's how you impress artists mm-hmm. especially new artists when you're building clientele you impress them by just like yeah. just doing shit you just do shit so it's 
So that means you're coming in with the presets kind of already in there. Yeah, or a good idea, you know, like for shit, the last five years, like you don't have to tell me to put the telephone ad lib on your voice. Like I already mm -hmm. got it. Like we're just going to do it. Yeah. And yeah, one person's going to say like, nah, that ain't my sound. But a hundred people are like, they're not even going to pick. You got my sound. You know my sound. Yeah. It's like, no, I know every sound that's out there right now. So that that's what we're going to do. All right. You're rapping about. You're rapping about some conscious shit, da 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 cool. We're going to use light compression on your vocal. We're going to tuck you underneath the snare. Right. We're going to do this, this, and this because that's what those artists do. Okay. You're rapping on some super high-energy auto-tune gang-gang shit, cool. We're going to distort the 808 a little bit. We're going to leave your vocals really loud. We're going to telephone ad-lib you because that's what those do. That's it, yeah. And you're not, you, that doesn't discount anything, but you just kind of knowing what's going on around you mm -hmm. gives people confidence in what you do. But as you start working with bigger artists and better artists then it's always like nah what do, what do I need to do different now mm -hmm. so they don't sound like everything else and they don't sound like everybody else no more mm -hmm. you get people to trust you by being able to make them sound like whatever's in their head yeah. if I see if I see Drake type beat I've already got a good idea of mm -hmm. oh, should I do ad-libs nah what do you mean nah like, what ad is Drake doing right now yeah you gotta make that that mix yeah. sit on top like the Drake mix yeah and like your like, vocal needs to be big and forward and yeah. stuff like that if I get this Playboy Cardi type beat why would I mix that for four hours cause I will over mix it I will make it something that it's, it's supposed to sound like, yeah. like you and I just did this song in ten minutes mm -hmm. like that's that's what it's supposed to sound like and I think a good engineer is able to kinda look at music like that mm -hmm. the artist is looking at music from what they're saying from their words the producer's looking at music from what their beats are like I use this snare this kick this 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 that from that you know or this transition needs to happen here and it needs to blow up during the hook yeah I think a good mixing engineer needs to be like okay what is everybody trying to do here and what's the one thing that no one's ever going to talk about that I'm going to do that's going to make it glue like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because again we don't we don't do a good job of talking to people about what we do yeah we know the producer makes the beat. We know the rap artist writes the shit or like freestyles it and puts the words on there. Mm -hmm. But you ask somebody what a mixing engineer does, and they're like, oh, or a mastering engineer, and they're like, I don't know, balancing shit, right? You know. But <laughs> yeah. we've already established like balancing. Like, I can find you twenty different examples of where that snare should be. Mm -hmm. But it's like, what's best for this song? What's best for this artist? Like, what is this person trying to do? Right. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, how do you get the best sound out of? I hear you got the. You, you got the mattress. How, how do you get the the best possible sound out of out of the house without soundproofing the whole room? And you know, cause like my my home studio, I just had like like one little square foam patch hanging above the microphone, and that was my soundproofing. Man, it's just a, a lot of trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, I still do the I still do the thing of like having to go out to the car and check. The car test. The the car test, guys. The car test. Um, for home engineers, though, I recommend I do recommend getting a good pair of like AKG seven hundred twos or like a good pair of headphones mm -hmm. that are like over the ear headphones, yeah. but open back. And um, there's also some really good software called um, Sonarworks or Sound ID Reference mm -hmm. that I recommend everybody check out and try. Okay. And because what that does is that software, it it comes with a microphone, a calibration microphone. And it shoots static. It shoots pink noise and white noise and shit out of, out of your speakers. It just sounds like static, like shh. Mm -hmm. And it, you stand in certain spots in the room, and it measures the noise profile of the room. Mm -hmm. And the, its goal is to make your room and your listening environment flat. Yeah. Um, I, I'll show you it on here too. Even here, even though this room is designed to sound good mm -hmm. and be acoustically treated, and we've got special foam inside the walls and all sorts of shit. Yeah still use the software over here because I want the room to be as flat as possible because mm. when you're mixing flat if you make a, a 1 dB boost at like 50 hertz then you hear that kick you hear the kick jump yeah and at home when I used to not think about the room correction and stuff like that I'd be bringing shit up like 6 decibels mm. and not hear it not, like why don't I hear this and it's just like just the understanding that your room has a sound and you've got to figure out what that sound is right. if I um, in my room Everything sounds like it's got a real big bump at like 250 hertz, mm -hmm. which is like this ugly, boxy, muddy, shitty part in a mix. Yeah, it's never like a. a I never find I never find people trying to put a lot of energy right there. Mm -hmm. But in my room, just the way the desk is, and the I got a fucking glass window right behind where oh, I mix, man. which is like terrible. Mm -hmm. But I realized that that's there, and I got used to like not thinking about it when I mix. 
and then it translates better in the car and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's just like just kind of f trying to figure out what your room is. Okay. And okay. being real honest with yourself, like, oh wait, when I take this out to the car, this sounds like shit. Mm -hmm. Or that's, what part of this sounds like you. shit? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Car thing. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, man. Uh, that that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, uh, I'd love to to come back and do one of these again. You know, later down the line. Cause you just got so much, and I know they're gonna they're gonna love this, man. And I, I'm, I'm gonna let you know the feedback. But yeah, man, once again, it's it's, it's been a pleasure to come here and meet your your lovely wife, your you. your coworkers, just see everything. This has really been a treat for me. You know, I had to I had to BGs for the longest, just nervous to, you know. <laughs> I don't Bro, that's crazy. I was nervous to meet you. I'm watching your content. I'm seeing the game that you're spitting on everybody. Yeah. Telling everybody. Your bar count video, like that's the best one in the world. Oh yeah. Like that's the first bar count video I, I felt like I could send to anybody and they'd be like, Oh, that's it? Appreciate it. Because it's just like that. It, it's real easy to overcomplicate stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you're just there like with the beat on going Oh yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Like why can't you figure it out? Like yeah. don't don't overcomplicate stuff, man. It's simple. We're we all can make music. We all can make content. We all can make music. We we just gotta do it. But man, thank you, thank you so much too, man. Just for to even meeting and coming into the building, like. Oh yeah, man. It's it was a it was an honor, man. Uh, l let the people know where they could find you, uh, how they could get in contact with you, where you know. Um, at I Dream in Stereo on all social media here at Baron Studios in Houston. Um, that's it. And we got to get this guy to start making making content, man. He he take he take over. I'm telling you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, let's go check out the collective. Yeah.